Okay, great. So we're going to um, take a little bit of a transition here now uh, to Dr. Jody Johnson Maynard. I'm very excited. She's joining us from the University of Idaho, where she is a professor and the department head for the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Um, for those of you who are more traditional agronomists or growing field crops, she's going to talk to us more about that setting. Um, and I think we'll probably answer any of your earthworm questions that so far have not yet been answered. Um, so Jody, if you want to go ahead, we can just make sure that you are connected and that your mic is connected. I'm going to make you our speaker. Um, and you, I think you're self-muted. Um, you are muted. Do you see a little microphone button below your orange? arrow. Is that green? Oh, whenever you're ready, you can click it and it'll turn green and then your mic will be connected. Let's try this. Okay, I just sent you muted by organizer. Interesting. Okay, everybody, bear with us one minute. There we go. You should be all set. Hey. Now. Okay, <laughs> perfect. And perfect timing. We're at 1114. Um, so I'll make one more quick plug. If you haven't seen those pre-assessments, they are still in the chat box. Um, you can take the carbon one still. We're not going to transition into carbon until this afternoon, but last chance to peek um, at the earthworms for the pre-assessments. And uh, no rush, Jody. Whenever you are ready, we'll let you take it away. Great. Excellent. Sorry about that. I had to go shut my office doors. No problem. People are starting to come to work here. <laughs> and can everyone see my, no. No everyone. screen share yet. Okay. There we go. It. Yes. We're good. We see your desktop, but not yet your, uh, if you have a PowerPoint, not yet. Okay, sorry about that. I'm not used to this system. No. Nope. I need to find out how to do. You know what I can do? Make this easy. Is that better? Perfect. Yes. Okay, great. We're in business. I'm not We're used to this system, so please just yell at me if um, if anything goes wrong. Um, Okay, well, um, I'd like to thank Sam for the invitation to speak with you all today about two of my very favorite things, um, earthworms and soil. Um, I had a lot of fun putting this talk together, uh, just looking over past research and kind of bringing it together to a story. And, you know, this kind of research is, is pretty labor intensive and, and takes a long time. So, you know, it, it takes years for a for a faculty member really to to come up to speed and develop um, a, a story that is useful to people in terms of management. So happy to be here today. Um, I did kind of wish it was an in-person meeting because when I woke up, it was five degrees um, at my house when I left my house today. And I looked at the weather um, in Amherst and it actually looked much, much nicer, <laughs> but oh well. <laughs> so. Um, the uh, material that I'm going to be sharing with you today was really put together again over long periods of time um, as I've had students come and go in my research program here at the University of Idaho. Um, and it's been funded through a couple different sources, both the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Idaho Fish and Game, and USDA as well, the um, NEFA. And just a little background about myself. I am a soil scientist. I actually have a background in pedology and that's how I was educated and raised, so to speak. Um, and so I came through earthworms because I had this uh, real fascination and still do um, to understand how vegetation and organisms in general 
uh, can change soils and how plants and soils co-evolve um, with each other. And so I um, learned early on that earthworms um, can have a huge impact on soil properties and and have been studying them really ever since. So I don't come through, I don't come to this field as a biologist or a taxonomist or a zoologist. Um, I'm really, my main thing is to understand how these organisms um, can impact soils. And I have my email here. Please feel free to reach out if you have any follow-up questions after the presentation. Okay, so just a little bit of background. Um, probably many of you have visited um, Idaho or Washington where I do also work because I, uh, Moscow, University of Idaho is in Moscow, which is located uh, right on the Washington-Idaho border, or very close to it. Uh, but it is a very different environment than, than what you all are, are used to. So I'll just sort of put that in a reference for you um, or put that in context. Um, the area I work at is kind of shown in this green area on the map, um, Moscow, Idaho. And if you look at this map, what it's showing is this really pretty extreme um, climatic gradient where we have, I have research going on in this um, location of Genesee, Idaho, uh, which has receives about 49 and a half um, um, centimeters of rain per year. And then we go all the way out, it's not that long of a drive, a couple hours to Ritzville, Washington, and we have about 28. And so we talk about these different um, cropping systems or cropping zones or agroecological zones, if you will, across this climatic gradient uh, where we have annual production, where we have enough rainfall every year and precipitation to have a crop in every single year. I should start by telling you this is all dry land production, so absolutely no irrigation or very little irrigation in this region. Um, this transition zone, which is shown in blue, where we actually utilize fallow, where we don't plant any crop and we allow sto soil moisture to be stored in the soil uh, in one ev out of every three years in the rotation. And then Ritzville, where it's pretty much impossible to go grow a crop every year, um, and fallow is routine because it's uh, such a dry climate and there's not enough moisture to support annual cropping. So big difference um, and this difference in this climate really does impact um, not just what the farmers grow, but the soil biology and the systems and the soils themselves. Um, in general, the whole region experiences a Mediterranean climate. So we have most of our rainfall in the late winter and um, early spring, and then long, dry, warm so, um, summers. So it's a xeric uh, regime. We have soils that range from mollusols and alphasols in the eastern part of the zone to aridosols in the west. So our more moist um, soils in the east, and again, kind of the drier, um, soils with carbonates in them, um, higher pH in the west. Uh, volcanic ash is present in the higher elevations of the study area, not so much where cropping systems are, but more in the forested areas. Um, and our area has quite a history with soil erosion. Uh, we farm some very, very steep slopes that I think um, when people come here from the Midwest, they're, they're shocked at the farming that's being done on slopes that are you know, 30, 35% um, slopes. And we are actually the home of the self-leveling combine, which was developed here because of our steep slopes. So a little bit of trivia, agricultural trivia for you as well. Um, this little dashed line is an approximation of the area that we call the Palouse. Um, bioregion, which is where the University of Idaho is more centrally located. And just a little bit about the Palouse, the place I live um, and work. It's a beautiful area. This map just kind of shows you uh, what we consider to be the core Palouse, which is really defined by this um, hilly topography, uh, which is both shaped by the, dust, uh, dis the um, deposition of LUS, um, which is the main parent material for our soils. So that is a high silt type parent material with 
excellent water holding capacity, but of course it tends to lead to poor aggregation and highly erosive soils. Um, and a, a unique bunch grass uh, plant community called Palouse Prairie. And Palouse Prairie isn't really well known. Um, <clears throat> it is a pretty rare plant community. It, uh, we estimate that there's about a tenth of a percent of Palouse Prairie remaining, and most of it was turned over um, very early when the area was settled um, by Europeans and farming began. I mentioned erosion. Again, anytime you have bare soils on steep slopes with um, highly erosive soils, um, silt loam textured soils, you tend to have a lot of erosion. And so unfortunately, uh, features like this in the landscape with these rills and gullies um, develop. Um, you'll also see these slides in the spring often as that upper layer of lus wets up and then just slips off the landscape. So we have battled erosion. Um, it was a terrible situation. We did have um, 30 years of conservation um, education put in place um, starting about the 1960s, late 60s. And actually we've, we've learned a lot and we um, now have uh, less soil erosion. We used to actually have the highest erosion rates in the country. That um, is no longer true, although in uh, springs, for example, when we have high moisture and the fields are very wet and the farmers don't plant, we once again see those really high erosion rates. We are also the home of the giant Palouse earthworm, which I have to mention, uh, a very photogenic earthworm. Um, and this species is of interest because it is native to our area. Um, it is called giant. However, I Kind of refer to it as the larger than average Palouse earthworm because it is not in fact a true giant, but it is very large. Um, in terms of earthworms, we don't have a high uh, diversity, but it is good to see that we still have some native species that can be found despite uh, the major uh, land use changes that have occurred in our region. Okay, so a little bit of background, and I think the previous speaker covered um, a lot of this, so I'll, I'll just um, go through this pretty quickly. Um, the, the number of, of species that we have, uh, you know, I've seen estimates of 3,500 up to 7,000 species. Um, but I think the interesting thing here to keep in mind is that we're still finding new species and recording new species. Uh, which is very interesting and, and, you know, there is a real problem with earthworm taxonomy. It is somewhat confusing um, and we do not have a lot of working taxonomists. So it's a kind of a difficult area to keep this updated. Um, you know, this is a little bit older data, so it's probably closer to 7,000, but I imagine that there are more than that that exists that have not been recorded yet. And they are present on every continent except Antarctica. So they are really common animals out there um, and they can do various things as again, as highlighted by your previous speaker. Um, across the globe, earthworms can range in size. Um, of course, uh, they are all the way from two meters to very, uh, just a few millimeters in length. So very, very tiny to almost more snake-like features, uh, earthworm species that exist. And these pictures of giant blue earthworm, or giant earthworms, excuse me, uh, were taken in, in Ecuador. Um, in the Palouse, I mentioned that we don't have a wide diversity or high diversity of earthworm species. We have the native species, which is um, not very common, unfortunately, at this point, uh, but you can still find them. And that is Drillolaris um, species or um, specific to the Palouse region, Drillolaris americanus, which again is known as the giant Palouse earthworm. Um, as you can see in this photo, uh, not quite as impressive, impressive as these giant worms from Ecuador, um, but they can get to be 14, 16 inches, maybe a little bit longer. So they are larger than the average worm. This is our most common worm by far, a trapezoides. Um, and this is a very, very successful invasive European worm. It's found 
basically all across the United States. Um, it is very well suited. It seems to be pretty um, opportunistic in terms of diet. It can be very resistant um, and survive very, very well, even in our soils that do um, experience a very significant sometimes drying period. Okay, a little bit about earthworm reproduction um, because this is important um, to understand how invasive earthworms may move or if you're trying to um, build earthworm populations in your soils. Um, the sexual maturity can be reached in a number of months to years. It really depends on species and also the environmental conditions, which is, which is pretty interesting. Um, Cocoons can be produced throughout the year, and the cocoon is basically the structure that houses um, the, uh, earthworm eggs and kind of protects them while they're incubating in the soil. Uh, the number of cocoons can depend on species, uh, anywhere from three to 100 per year for lumbricids, um, those European invasive worms, one to two hatchlings per cocoon. Prime uh, production depends on many factors, the population density of the earthworm to begin with, um, soil temperature, moisture, and food quality. And those are really the big things that we look at when we're thinking about um, earthworm survival and how large the population will be. What is the soil temperature and moisture regime? Um, is it um, adequate throughout the year or is only a, a typical short time window where the earthworms are very active um, and how what is the food quality and how much food is present. Uh, the incubation time is somewhat sensitive to environmental conditions which is also interesting um, and I have an example here from an older uh, older piece of work uh, done by Lee in 1986 where depending on the temperature regime those cocoons hatched in either 36 or 112 days. And that's probably a, a pretty important um, strategy uh, for survival if you can put off hatching um, until conditions are maybe a little bit better for survival. And again, this is particularly important in our um, area because we do have that moisture deficit uh, during the summer. So I'm really interested in earthworm survival strategies because I have seen fields where that were treated um, with various compounds. One example that comes to mind always is uh, mustard meal, which is, uh, you know, mustards we'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. We use them to actually um, extract earthworms because they're irritants um, and can be toxic. So the mustard extract itself. Um, and so I'm, uh, but, after that was done in this one site, for example, I went back, you know, a few months, or actually it was next year, I went back and the earthworm population density was just as large as it had been. So how do these creatures that are seemingly so sensitive to environmental conditions um, and, you know, can't dry out or anything along those lines actually survive and have sometimes really high populations? Um, so they can produce some species, most species can produce without a partner, which probably helps. Um, they tend to produce more cocoons than what is needed to really maintain a stable population of earthworms. Again, their cocoons um, have, can have variable incubation times. And um, important, again, in, in our environment out here where the topsoil will dry out, you can have species that burrow very deep into the soil and that likely protects them from um, changes that are happening near the surface of the soil. And a lot of the species we have here will actually um, carry out estivation. And so this earthworm you can see in this photo is curled up in a tight little ball and they, uh, main, they'll go into esti in a vest estivation state when conditions are dry and become poor. And basically they curl up in this little ball, they're covered with mucus and they're protected from desiccation inside these estivation chambers in the soil. So this is really a common strategy that we see um, in soils that do um, have those conditions that do not favor earthworm um, survival. 
And so very, very common to find earthworms in this state in the drier periods of the year in all of our systems, even in our annual production zone where we have um, plentiful soil moisture. Okay, um, so just a little bit about native species and um, the this map just shows kind of a distribution of um, earthworm native species in the US and interestingly, uh, probably your first speaker, I didn't get to hear her whole presentation touched on this, uh, but because of repeated glaciation, a lot of that area in, in the northern parts of the United States and Canada were actually um, completely earthworm free. And that was the case in very northern Idaho. You can see just the tip of Idaho right here and in Washington. And it's very interesting to me that um, the exotic species haven't really uh, colonated those areas um, to the extent that they have in the, uh, in the uh, eastern US, northeastern US. Um, and, and the native earthworms seemingly haven't recolonated. So it's, it's pretty interesting and a little bit different from what we um, see in the, in the um, first talk. There are little patches of areas uh, that don't really show up because of the spatial scale that you find them at in both northern Idaho and Washington that were probably protected um, from the ice sheets that, that would come down and the periodic um, uh, conditions. And we still do find native species in those pockets. So those areas create uh, refugia for the native species. But again, we don't see them uh, spreading again back across that entire area. So that's an interesting, um, interesting finding. Okay, um, so ecological strategies are really important. Um, and it seems that you all um, talked about this uh, and the first talk, so I'm just going to go over it really quickly again. The major groups, epigeic, anisic, and endogeic. Um, epigeic, close to the surface, so their impacts on the soil are going to be fairly shallow. Um, those species are not extremely common um, in the areas I work on in the Palouse. Um, I think because of that deficit that we have in soil moisture and the warm conditions that are experienced, even though the soil can moderate and litter layers moderate that somewhat, um, it doesn't favor the existence of, of epigeic species. There's anisic, um, which have the deep vertical burrows, cast, tend to cast at the surface. Um, and then the endogeic, which are particularly important to um, earthworm uh, ecology here in the Palouse and the broader region uh, in the inland Pacific Northwest. Uh, because they are so common. Uh, the trapezoides, a trapezoides, that is an endogeic species. Now, while I, I feel that these groups are extremely important um, to recognize because they have different impacts on the soil, um, I do want to point out that they're usually not, uh, you don't find species typically that are strictly anisic, right? They have, may have a few properties of each. And certainly I feel that's the case with A. trapezoides, and it's probably what's allowed it to be such a successful invader. And it can have, you know, some anisic, some endogeic properties, um, depending on the situation. It can alter its diet and eat uh, basically whatever is present. And we have some data on, on that using stable isotopes and feeding studies. Um, and so this framework is really helpful in understanding and predicting earthworm impacts. But again, recognize that there can be some in-between um, behaviors. Okay, so how do we measure earthworms? Um, well, for research, of course, is very different than what I typically talk to my farmers and landowners about doing. Um, but generally what we wanna report is always a number of individuals per unit area or volume. It's actually always a volume, um, typically a volume of soil that we're sampling, but it's always expressed on an area basis. 
Um, and so it's important to know what that volume of soil is that was sampled. And most publications or data that you see will, will say something in the methodology that, you know, a soil earthworm pit was dug to 50 centimeters or whatever depth that they used. Um, so you always have to compare those soil depths um, and make sure to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. Um, we also report biomass per unit area or volume. And again, I think that's really important to actually give both the density and the biomass. Um, and in some cases I can think of here, if I go sample in the spring, I might have a tremendous number of individuals per unit area, but their biomass may be very, very low. And that's because they're all in that hatchling or juvenile stage. So very, very important to um, report both of those. We also um, try to always report the diversity. And again, I think, and this is kind of uh, supporting what your, what your first speaker was talking about this morning, the diversity is really important to know, not just how many are there, but who is there, because the impacts of two different earthworms can be uh, dramatic on, dramatically different on a soil. So we talk about diversity in terms of the total number of species present, the type of the uh, names of those species present, their ecological role, or their functional diversity. Okay, so if I say that we have anisic species present, then right away you should think, okay, these uh, species are probably gonna have an impact on drainage infiltration rate because they have those long deep burrows. And we can also talk about genetic diversity. And we are doing more and more in terms of looking at earthworms um, and through D DNA sequencing. And I, I think that's another story, but that's really important to some of the struggles that we have with earthworm taxonomy. Uh, so that is how we generally uh, report earthworms in the literature. Um, again, just make sure that if you're comparing sites that you know that the uh, similar amounts of volume of soil were sampled Okay, the sampling that we do um, can be done many different ways. Um, the, probably the most common are shown here. Number one would be hand sorting, which you can see a, a picture of me up here doing where we basically collect soil, we sort it out in these sieves by hand and we remove all of the earthworms and cocoons that are present in that soil. So again, it is pretty time consuming and laborious work. Um, and that's probably one reason why you don't see a whole lot of earthworm surveys being done across large areas. Uh, we can do a hot mustard extraction. So basically you mix, uh, make a, a mixture of uh, mustard, which is like the mustard that you can buy in the grocery store, the powdered mustard. Um, and basically pour that inside this frame that has been hammered into the soil and then that goes down through the pores um, that is an irritant and it brings the earthworms upward to the surface and then you can collect them and count them. The, uh, um, you can also use um, a pure compound allele isothiocyanate, which is actually the active ingredient in the mustard. This is just a more pure form uh, that you can purchase. And finally, the electroshocker or the octet method and you can see a person in my lab group doing that here. This is the electroshocker that produces the current and you can hopefully see these individual probes on the ground. And we apply the current in al to alternating pairs of those uh, probes that go down into the soil. Again, it irritates the earthworms. They move upwards where they can be counted and collected if you wanna take them back to the lab to weigh them and to um, get species identification. So all these methods are very useful. Um, these two on the bottom, the octet and the mustard tend to favor that the, are the better ways to collect those deeper burrowing species. Hand sorting will underestimate the deep burrowers. Um, while you're digging that soil pit, uh, you know, they, they can kind of sense the vibration and can move away from your soil pit. So it, it is a problem. It's best to, to do both. And I've definitely done that where you dig a soil pit and hand sort and then apply the mustard so that you can get the deep burrowers or use the octet to get the um, 
the deep burrowing earthworms, the anisic species, although this is pretty restricted here in the Palouse because you have to have not too much soil moisture, but just the right amount uh, to be able to get that current to flow into the soil and to be very effective. Okay, so now that we've introduced earthworms a little bit, we'll talk about some of their beneficial impacts. Um, e the earthworms are, of course, known as ecosystem engineers. So we know that they actively change the soil and can change the habitat, uh, which impacts um, their survival as well as the survival of other um, organisms in the soil, which is quite important. Uh, we know that they incorporate organic materials um, into their casts and their burrows. So they're an important addition of organic matter to the soil profile. They can enhance nutrient cycling and some studies done on agroecosystems have shown that the annual, annual flux of nitrogen through the earthworm biomass is about nine to 66 um, pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. Um, which can be pretty significant depending on the crop that you're growing and of course the cost of, of nitrogen fertilizer. Um, they've also, uh, researchers have looked at the amount of nitrogen excreted um, by earthworms and in this particular case in a fertilized corn system found that it equaled about 22% of crop nitrogen uptake. Okay, so these kind of interactions, uh, especially with nitrogen, are really important to, to crop health and, and probably plant growth in non-agricultural systems. Um, and in the past, maybe these numbers haven't seen that dramatic, but I think as farmers everywhere are trying to decrease their re uh, reliance on synthetic inputs, which I know is a huge goal here in the Palouse as well as in other areas, um, you know, these numbers become more and more significant. Um, there have been a, a few different um, studies that have reviewed the literature um, and have shown that earthworms do tend to increase yields by anywhere from 25 to 35 percent, depending on the crop um, or the, the plant community. So, um, overall, we do know that they can have a pretty significant impact um, positive impact. So the um, this image I've shown here, if you've sat through a soil health talk, you've probably seen something very similar to this, where we talk about soil health being really at the intersection of this physical, chemical, and biological um, components of the soil. And I think that uh, focusing on earthworms is really significant when we're talking about soil health because they actually are at that center. Through their activity, they're impacting the chemical environment, they're impacting the physical environment quite substantially in some cases. Um, and so they are considered to be an important indicator of soil health um, in, in agricultural systems. And again, they are integrators through their activities, they'll impact all three, all three of these um, spheres. And so um, we look to earthworms as telling us something about what's going on in the environment. Um, and that's a really important reason to study them. Okay, so um, let's talk about how they do that. First, we have burrow systems. And burrows can be really important um, to soils in terms of infiltration, movement of water, redistribution of water, as well as um, air and oxygen moving down through the soil profile. And in the case of anisic species like the nightcrawler, for example, you can have these long continuous deep burrows, um, perhaps a meter or more down through the soil profile. And um, in our environment here, these are really important features. And, you know, I've dug soil cores that are about a foot in diameter, and you may find up to 15 burrows in them. And so this is a really important um, mechanism to get water and air to move down through those soils. Now, um, in general, the earthworm, the invasive species that we have in the Palouse region, um, cause positive impacts on soils, but of course in some farming systems the bypass flow of water through these deep 
um, vertical burrows has been associated with the contamination of groundwater from nitrates or other chemicals present in agro ecosystems. So we do want to keep an eye out for that. Um, so far, it doesn't seem to be a problem in the Palouse, where many of our spe species are, anesic, are um, endogeic, excuse me. And um, my bottom photo didn't, the animation didn't quite work out here as I anticipated, but the interesting thing about the endogeic species um, and trapezoides in particular is that it tends to form these more horizontal burrows. And so it doesn't tend to have that, that um, real significant impact on the water redistribution um, that we see with the anisic species. The anisic species are not that common in our agricultural systems, but we do tend to see their populations building up as we have um, sites that have been managed by no-till agricultural for no-till agriculture for longer periods of time. So, um, you know, the oldest no-till um, system that we have present here is now probably about 40, 45 years old. And so as those systems mature and you have less disturbance that disrupts the burrow system itself, we do see um, a greater number of anisic species, especially um, night crawlers, moving into those agricultural systems. And so it may become a problem um, in the future, but right now it does not appear to be. The other thing that's interesting about trapezoides um, and, and other endogeic species is that they tend to backfill their burrows. And here, I hope you can see this in the white circle, this is a backfilled channel. And so we have um, the burrow itself just basically filled with these casts. Um, and so this is important because it can um, interfere with the flow of water, uh, but it's also probably a pretty important zone for um, nutrient exchange and uptake by roots. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, I think on the next slide. Oh, no, nope, not quite. Um, so I wanted to introduce this, this term drillosphere uh, because it is a really important concept. And most people have heard of the term rhizosphere, which is the zone right around roots. Usually we talk about it being about two millimeters um, away from the root that is really highly enriched because of the constant exudates, um, carbon compounds, you know, sugars, um, mucilage, other compounds being, um, being excreted by that root. And that increases microbial activity around the root zone. We have the same concept going on with earthworms, and, but we refer to it as the drillosphere. So an earthworm um, going through its burrow is going to bring down residue, which a crop residue or plant material that has carbon in it, that's going to feed bacteria and fungi. It uh, has mucus, which is going to um, be secreted and um, line the inside of that pore. And we have casts, as you saw in the last photo, that can be kind of squished into the walls of, of those burrows. And so this drillosphere concept is pretty important. Um, and it's a zone that is, has been shown to be enriched in carbon and nitrogen. Um, and other studies have shown increased microbial activity in the drillosphere, increased populations of grazers, such as protozoa, nematodes, and columbola. So it is a really important biological zone. And again, what's interesting about that is that these burrows, sometimes when they're abandoned, and even once in a while while they're, while they're still being actively used, roots can definitely um, go into those burrows and interact with the walls. And so this is likely an important zone, again, of nutrient transfer in the soil. Um, this is some work that a student of mine did um, just a couple years ago. And here you can see an earthworm burrow, okay? And you can see that dark lining kind of inside of it. And what he did was to sample in two millimeter, which was extremely difficult, um, um, or three millimeter um, distances away from that burrow. And this is just some of the data he's showing here, showing as a proportion. 
So total carbon was greatest um, zero to three centimeters away from the burrow itself, and then decreases as you move away from that burrow wall. Uh, we found the same thing for available phosphorus, higher um, near the in the drillosphere, and then decreasing as you move away from it, as well as ammonium increased in the drillosphere soil and then decreased as you approach bulk soil. So I think, again, this is interesting. It may not seem like a huge difference in phosphorus or ammonium, but again, the fact that these earthworm channels are uh, pretty easy for roots to explore. And also in some of these soils where we have very high densities of earthworms, the, the burrow systems are extensive. They're very, very visible, very easy to see, and the soils are just riddled with them. And so if you add up all of that volume of soil that's impacted by earthworms, it's probably pretty significant in terms of nutrient supply. Okay, of course I have to spend some time on casts. And these are the really nice, tend to be very spherical um, aggregates that are released by earthworms. And we know that from previous work that as earthworms ingest soil, they actually break it down. Those aggregates that they ingest can be completely broken down and then reformed at, in the um, back end of the earthworm gut. And so the aggregates themselves, you can see in this photo, um, the different particle sizes that are present. You can see organic matter. Um, there's lots of stuff going on in these um, casts. And the casts, as long as they are allowed to dry, um, can be very, very stable aggregates, which is important again in our soils that are high silt loam, um, are all silt loam textured, uh, because silt is known not to aggregate very well. So earthworm um, aggregates are actually really important in our systems in terms of creating these stable aggregates. And the um, casts themselves are important for physical um, reasons because they have these smaller pores within them that hold water and they actually define the macro pores that can occur between them. So they are really important structural units, um, but they're also important in, in terms of the chemistry uh, because these casts themselves can be highly enriched in nutrients. Um, and so where the earthworm produces these casts, whether it's on the surface, as you can see in this photo, or if they're back um, filling their burrows with them, those are again, hotspots for potential nutrient release and transfer to plant roots. Um, so we care about casts for both the chemical and the physical um, reasons and their impacts on soils. And again, in our poorly aggregated silt loam soils, these, these features are are probably pretty important in terms of the processes. Okay, um, this is kind of a busy slide, but I just wanted to put together in one place kind of what we've learned about earthworms um, in the past 20 years or so that I've been working in the Palouse region. Um, and we've looked at many different environments. So when we think about um, impacts of earthworms on land use. One of the things, um, this is a slide I'd like to show, just because the land use itself with its associated different levels of disturbance, um, chemical additions, um, management can have a large impact, not just on the density of the earthworms present, but also on the types. Now I mentioned that we don't have a real rich um, earthworm fauna here in the Palouse region. These are the species that Again, over a 20, these are the dominant species. There are a few other species that are popping up that are pretty limited in scope. Um, but these are the dominant ones that I've um, encountered. And so you can see even within one land use, for example, urban, that we have a big difference in terms of the diversity and the species present. Um, in grassland, we have CRP, which is conservation reserve um, plantings which is a program where the um, uh, government basically pays farmers to put their highly erodible land into some sort of permanent cover. And in the Palouse, most of that permanent cover uh, was planted at the beginning of the CRP program, which I believe was in the 80s, um, and are planted to non 
native grasses. Some of the newer plantings are, are more native species. Our native Palouse prairie, and then in agriculture, we've sampled no-till, till, and organic systems. And the only place where we find our native species is in the Palouse prairie, those remaining remnants, which are quite patchy across the landscape um, now. And um, you can see the distribution of these deep um, dwelling um, anisic species, such as El Terrestris or the Nightcrawler, um, is more common in the urban systems and um, found within the agricultural systems, primarily in no-till. And again, that's more common in those older systems that have matured. In terms of the density, um, you can see the differences here. And these numbers are not inclusive of all the measurements we've ever made. I just try to pick the ones that were sampled um, about the same time uh, because the density of earthworms does change over time. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but you can see that there is a pretty big difference in the density of earthworms present. Um, not higher in native prairie, which some people would think, uh, but our native prairie is, um, you know, a short grass, bunch grass type prairie. Um, it doesn't have extensive additions of uh, or amounts of carbon in it. Um, and also our remaining Palouse prairie does tend to be found on the steeper, more rocky lands. Um, and the sheer reason being that if it had been on a flat, flatter landscape position without rocks, it would have been farmed. So um, the numbers there are not necessarily as high as what we find in some of our managed systems. We also can have a lot of diversity within a system. For example, our urban, we found differences from about populations from about 26 to about 437 individuals per meter squared. This is just a blow up of that data. Um, and so our three urban systems that we studied were urban parks, which are fairly uh, well managed parks with irrigation and fertilizer um, and different treatments on the, the um, in terms of mulching and whatnot. Our old residential sites, which were greater than 75 years old. So these are more mature landscapes and old enough that the when they were constructed, we didn't see quite as much disturbance as we do nowadays, where we have the equipment that comes in and really just scrapes off that topsoil and levels, um, levels it and, and can do some compaction as well. And then urban systems, um, residential areas that were less than 10 years old. And you can see that the earthworm density and biomass did change drastically and was much, much higher in those urban park systems. Okay. We also saw um, those um, epigeic species present in the urban parks, those ones that can um, that tend to live in the upper parts of the litter layer and very upper part of the soil. Um, and the, that those species were absent from the other urban sites. Okay, so even within a land use, you can see quite a diversity depending on the specific management being done. And again, the urban parks were fertilized and irrigated. Uh, the residential, some of them were, uh, but people, I guess, in Moscow don't tend to care about their lawns that much because um, a lot of the older residential homes uh, were not irrigated and not fertilized as well. Okay, um, we also have work done in Palouse Prairie. And again, just to show that even within one land use classification, you can have a lot of diversity. And so this was a study uh, one of my students uh, worked on. And we looked at three different zones on the same hill slope in a Palouse Prairie remnant. And we had one defined by a shrubby species called snowberry, which is quite a beautiful native shrub. Uh, we had a mixed zone with lots and lots of prickly lettuce and other weeds and some native species mixed in. And then we had a zone where we had still a, a pretty healthy stand of our native grasses. Um, and that one was primarily native with some invasive weed species. Okay, the earthworm community, um, again, you can see that the numbers here were a little bit lower. 
um, than in some of our other studies. This, this slide is actually showing the biomass here, but um, you know, fairly high in that mixed zone where we actually had more plant biomass added um, through those invasive species relative to that mostly native and snowberry range. Again, snowberry being a shrub that has kind of leathery um, leaves that fall to the ground. So um, probably a, a difference here in both plant um, biomass produced as well as the uh, palatability or quality of that food for the earthworms. Okay, so moving on here um, to management. So we looked at land use impacts and now we're looking at specific management practices. And this is just data from a long-term uh, study that we have going um, at a farm nearby. And here we've been comparing areas in um, that are managed by both no-till, the NT, and chisel plow. And chisel plow is a a uh, form of tillage, a form of conservation tillage that um, causes more more disturbance than than no-till, but not as much as traditional tillage where the whole soil is inverted. And in this slide, I'm just showing cocoons, and you can see that cocoon production in every single year measured was greater in no-till compared to conventional till. And this is not uncommon findings um, for tillage comparisons. Um, but I also wanted to show this slide just to point out the kind of variability that we see from year to year in a system. So a lot of times when people will go in and maybe they'll sample one or two years of earthworm density, um, you know, it, it's good to sample multiple years and two is better than one for sure. But you can see that you're really not capturing the whole entire picture here. So um, you see a lot more diversity in, in our variation in these numbers in the no-till system, which more closely replicates a natural system, less diversity in the more highly disturbed um, chisel plow system, or less variation, I should say. We also looked at the factors that were influencing the earthworm populations and cocoon production in particular. And so what we found there is that thing, factors like summer precip are really important in predicting uh, the cocoon production um, in a negative way, um, and precip was the big significant one here. But note that some of these um, values indicating significance are pretty different between the no-till and the conventional till. Okay, so again, the, the, the main point here is that your management has a large impact on the earthworm population. And, um, you know, studies like these that can is isolate the particular factors that are important in driving that population change and density are really important in trying to model um, earthworm impacts in soils. Okay, this is some work that we did in those different agroecosystem zones that I showed in the first slide. Um, and I think that this is an important thing to do, not just in soils that receive, the, um, you know, drier, that have drier conditions, but in any soils that have um, conditions that may be, um, may be inhospitable to earthworm populations. So whether it's cold, frozen conditions, um, wet conditions, saturated conditions, um, it's really important to understand what these populations are doing. So um, we had, fields that we sampled over um, a few years of study, a three-year study, um, and we would go back to the same fields over and over again in each of these different crop zones um, on an annual basis. And so basically, when we were talking about annual precip from anywhere from zero to about 350 millimeters, we found zero earthworms. <laughs> Past that, we would start to pick up fairly high earthworm um, densities. Okay, so we have this threshold that was found that is pretty clear um, in terms of too dry for earthworms, wet, uh, wet enough for, for earthworms. And then within each of these different um, symbols that you see within annual, for example, which did tend to have the highest densities versus the transition zone where we use fallow once every three years and then the crop fallow zone, you can still see quite a bit of diversity. Um, and some of that has to do with management. 
Okay, so this is just showing um, kind of this these interactions that occur that are just really, really hard to untangle. Here we have, <clears throat> excuse me, two different tillage systems under different climatic zones. So one would be the wetter zones, higher soil moisture, higher precip, and <clears throat> six are, are very, very dry zones um, that you would see kind of out past the Ritzville area that I showed in that first map. So by the time you get to five, you start seeing irrigation. Six, basically um, almost all ag is, is irrigated in that region. And so you can see that even within a zone and a management system, we have a fair amount of variation in the earthworm numbers. Um, this conservation tillage irrigated site are, was the highest I've ever measured in my entire career um, in measuring in three different states. That's the highest number I've ever seen, um, but it was an irrigated area. Now in other irrigated areas, we don't see that response. We see very low densities. And I think that the reason is, is that in this zone, it's so incredibly dry that basically there's no earthworms naturally occurring to inoculate those fields. So it doesn't matter if you irrigate and your farm is surrounded, your field is surrounded by earthworm free land, um, the earthworms aren't gonna come there unless you can try to inoculate them somehow. Uh, but in other zones where you may have populations um, in field margins or in nearby forest or prairie, whatever you have um, in connection with your farm field, you can have that natural migration of earthworms into the field where conditions are positive, um, are good for them in terms of irrigation and soil moisture. So again, lots of different management, climate, to, um, and interactions going on here. Fertilizer regimes, disturbance level, um, any practices that include fungicides or other um, pesticides put on the ground have to be considered. And this is another study where we have changed crop rotation. Um, and so we have a business as usual at both of these sites. Genesee, Idaho is in an annual production zone, so it's wetter, uh, more precip. St. John is in our transition zone, so we use fallow. Oops, sorry about that. Oh, and I just made it worse. Okay, so the, the point here being um, that when we replace fallow with either a forage crop, which is FOR in the blue line here, the dark blue, or when we replace fallow with a winter pea crop, um, what we see is that we do have a response in earthworm density um, compared to the, the um, BAU, our business as usual rotation that includes fallow. Um, but it's not quite as significant as what I would imagine it, it would be, even though we're um, adding so much more organic matter through that forage crop or the winter pea as opposed to fallow. And, um, and again, this kind of goes back to those factors that influence earthworms. There's both the food source and food quality, uh, which we know winter pea is a, is a good food quality for earthworms. Um, but it also has to do with soil moisture. And so there's definitely a benefit in that fallow period of stored soil moisture that probably um, increases earthworm cocoon production and the density in the following year. So we tend to see lag effects of our management practices here. In the wetter site, um, there may also be a response here in winter pea. Um, again, not really significant at this point, statistically speaking, um, largely because of um, the variability that we see. So do notice those error bars. Jody, I, sorry, I wanna interrupt you, but we have about five minutes left and I wanted to um, let some questions sneak in if you wanna maybe transition to question time. Sure, that would be great. Um, I'll just leave up this slide and um, we can go, okay, I'll just go through these super quick here, just showing positive um, relationships between earthworms and other soil health indicators. The, um, what makes a good soil health indicator? And I will end here with the earthworms, uh, the positives and negatives as indicators. <laughs> 
Oh, perfect. You know, and I actually um, maybe we'll be able to dovetail back into that because there there were a few questions about indicators. Um, so I, I've received a few private messages saying we really need to rethink how we're talking about earthworms. Um, I think there's been a realization that and, and this rolls into a question. Maybe some of us have been taking too simple of an approach. So a, a very common infield assessment is dig a hole and count. And so one question is, um, you know, with that in mind, do you think that the classic dig a hole and count, invasive jumping worms aside, is still a good indicator for a simple or average user? Or should we be putting efforts into making more detailed assessments based on, you know, what type of system you're in or one of those three classifications of earthworms? Yeah. So what I heard from the first presentation, I think it's much easier here on the Palouse because we do have a limited number of earthworms and we don't tend to see uh, many negative impacts of, of these invasives that we have present. And so I do always tell my growers that, right? If you take a big, big shovel full, a healthy shovel full of soil, um, you know, I want you to find at least five earthworms per shovel. And, and I think that is a easy field assessment for them to do. Um, it's very visual. And so it's, you know, and, and I, so I do recommend that all the time. My big caution to them is that if you have a year where you don't find five, don't panic. Because, you know, I showed that diverse, uh, that variation in earthworm cocoon production every year, and that translates to the adult population. So, you know, just because you have a year where you don't find a lot of earthworms doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong. Just be patient, keep measuring. Um, and another question that came in is um, related to this idea that when we take soil samples, we sample for known spatial variation, uphill, downhill, cornfield, soybean field. Should we be further changing where we're sampling if we have a known high population of earthworms and separate that from lower populations? You know, as you see on your slide here, there does say there's spatial and temporal variability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not only that, but we have um, some data I didn't have time to put in here showing that the active period of earthworms, again, our earthworms will go into estivation when the fields start to dry out, that active period of earthworms can vary based on landscape position. And so I do think that is important. You know, your wetter landscapes, you're going uh, positions in a field, you're going to have higher densities of earthworms. There could be something that could favor one species over another across a field. And so, you know, you wanna do something about that spatial variability. Either you go sample in different zones and you go back to those same zones year after year, um, or you just find kind of a mid area, right? Where you, it's not too wet, it's not too dry, it's not too deep, not too shallow, and keep going back to that one area. But definitely you can find a tremendous difference, um, you know, a hundred times different between landscape positions in a field. Great, thank you. Um, I do, let me just check for any questions that just came in. I, I think that was the, the, a lot of them were about thinking about this for indicators, I, I think you hit the main ideas. Um, th the other question that I'll share for the audience was, um, is this recorded and can we see these slides? So yes, it is um, recorded and, and I'll ask the speakers also if we could have their slides so that you can um, sort of pass through them um, on, your, on your own. So I do wanna give everybody about a five minute break before we transition to Freya's in, in case you wanna grab a coffee or use the restroom. Um, so, Jody, thank you so much for, for being here today um, between you and Anise. I think I see a lab meeting in our future and some, some summer um, talk about how we can better identify earthworms in, in the field. So stay tuned for that.